Kitchen of Cambridge University was formally opened by a high mass at King's College Chapel. One of the first acts of the visitors was to solemnly pronounce a sentence of condemnation and exhumation over a tomb. A lengthy sermon was preached upon the implausible text, the unlikely text, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. A body was then disinterred and ceremoniously burned to ashes in the marketplace hard by. Along with a cartload of books, the execrated corpse had authored when animate. <clears throat> Next morning, a great tub of water, full of water, was poured around the exterior of Great St. Mary's the university church, and thrice within to hallow it from its recent tincture. Finally, a solemn procession wound its way through the narrow streets to twist the colleges. The university cross bear at the head, followed by decked out doctors of divinity, each with a blazing torch held aloft. Then a canopy, and under it, in a monstrance, the holy sacrament. The uh, solemnity was marked slightly by the fact that the day was muddy, a typical English day, and many a gown was liberally bespattered, and substantially uh, by an awkward few minutes when the canopy actually caught fire through one of the tapers. <laughs> but the urgent deed had been accomplished. The university had been purged of the pestilential presence. Whose was this corpse which so defied? Whose past presence, so poison and pestiferous, it had to be ceremoniously exorcised? Well, the man exhumed was Martin Bucer, a great reformer of Strasbourg, who spent his last year sowing and watering the Reformation seed in England. Bucer was born November 11th, we just missed it yesterday, November 11th, 1491, in the Alsatian town of Schlechstadt, or Senestadt. Uh, in that town, there was a renowned Latin school, and in that school, little Martin showed such precocity that his friends voted him winner of the, I kid you not, most likely to become pope category. <laughs> they actually had that uh, in those days. Wow. <laughs> uh, but a far better sphere was open to him, that of becoming a reformer. At 15, lacking the finances to go to university on his own, he entered the Dominican order. This was the old ROTC method of financing your education in that day. Well, the Dominican curriculum <clears throat> diverted him from his humanistic studies into the scholastics of the Middle Ages, and especially Thomas Aquinas. And through those endeavors, he acquired no small facility in the subtleties of reasoning. Later in life, one would say of him, that he was, quote, more fertile in distinctions than most the most refined scholastic. Well, for, uh, but for Aquinas, he never got over his disrelish. He didn't like Aquinas. But Bucer was about, however, to discover something very much to his taste. Though a Dominican, Bucer attended the general chapter of the Augustinians at Heidelberg in 1518. And there he heard defended certain theses by a recent professor of Wittenberg. Bucer was completely captivated by how biblical the Wittenberger was. Why, in his explanations, wrote Bucer, you could recognize Paul. Now there's a real authentic theologian, said Bucer. The theses the Wittenberger defended rejected all works as contributory to salvation, and asserted, asserted instead that it was exclusively by grace that we are saved. While other Dominicans present furiously broke lances with the Augustinian guest. As Bucer relates, although our chief men refuted him with all their might, their wiles were unable to make him move an inch from his proposition. Though the Dominicans were the traditional rivals and opponents of the Augustinians, Bucer that day was being drawn well across party lines with unbounded delight 
he was able to sit next to his new hero at dinner. A rich supper with doctrine rather than dainties, as he put it. Booster had heard the gospel that day and embraced it with joy. Of his ecstatic dinner companion, Luther said, for Luther was the Wittenberger, Booster was the only Dominican without guile. Booster now devoured Luther's writings alongside Erasmus's. Uh, neither was he a passive or silent ally, for from the first, he threw himself wholeheartedly into the struggle for the gospel. Soon, he had attained dangerously conspicuous prominence by publicly defending Luther in disputation with that uh, blustering hammer of heretics, Johannes Kochlius, Dobneck, the one of infamy that uh, we heard about in the Tyndale lecture. He was now restive, uh, Bucinus is, now restive about his allegiance to his order, the Dominicans. After all, Dominicans had a corporate commitment to their own son, Tetzel, uh, in his combat with Luther over indulgences, you recall. So Bucer secured release from his vows by appealing that he had joined the order before he had reached his age of discretion. Uh, this would be something that could let you off, especially if you greased a few palms uh, while you were at it. So now he was free from his vows. <coughs> what would he do? Well, he took another bold step by taking a wife, <clears throat> a former nun, as was the specialty of reformers, it seems very, <laughs> nuns, uh, very typical of them. And this step uh, made him one of the first of the reforming clergy to uh, take the plunge into clerical matrimony, 1522, so quite, quite early. It also got him excommunicated and uh, rendered him a fugitive from the church law, which prevailed over most of Europe still at that, at that time. Of uh, Elizabeth, his wife, one historian writes, Elizabeth Booser was no scholar, no intellectual genius like her husband, but as a mother and a housekeeper, she was worth more than a whole kettle full of rubies. Never conspicuous, never a brilliant conversationalist, she possessed nonetheless a genius for orderliness and economy that provided the stage upon which her husband played the role of hospitable host. If he wrote ponderous treatises, it was because she relieved him of the task of telling bedtime stories. If he took a leading part in colloquies here, there, and everywhere, it was because his departure seemed to make no difference at all in the perfect functioning of his home. If he showed an energy that was inexhaustible, it was because Frau Elizabeth took upon herself all the enervating worries about the wherewithal of existence. She would bear him 13 children, but this is to get ahead of our story. Well, the newlyweds uh, made their way to Strasbourg, arriving in May of 1523, unknown, penniless, and jobless. Providentially, his parents had recently moved to Strasbourg as citizens and were able to secure permission for the newly wedded priest and nun, again, uh, very illegal to stay, despite protests of the local bishop. Wind of, winds of change had already begun to blow in Strasbourg, and Martin uh, arrived to find quite a coterie already actively fermenting reform in that city. The pioneer had been uh, a Matthew Sell, or Matthias Sell, who as early as 1521 had begun to preach in a small chapel in the cathedral. Well, as more and more Strasburgers were drawn to his fiery eloquence, the little chapel could no longer accommodate the burgeoning crowd. Sell so then uh, mounted the main cathedral pulpit, uh, but the next time he discovered that the bishop had locked it so as to prevent him from preaching there. Well, unwilling to be stymied, some uh, carpenters in a nearby street quickly constructed a little portable pulpit for Tzell to use, carrying it into the cathedral whenever he needed it uh, to preach, and then out again whenever he was done. So this device rendered Tzell audible to all the even 2,000, even 3,000 at times that gathered to hear him. 
The year Busa arrived, Sel had completed his breach with Rome by himself uh, marrying um, and this remarkable wife, uh, Catalina, we hope to make the subject of her own lecture, an entire lecture on her. Mm. Uh, all right. Well, after Zell had begun the work, he was joined by Wolfgang Capito, who had been cathedral preacher at Basel and a co-labor of Ucolampadius. We'll talk about Ucolampadius hopefully next week. A Capito's dizzying academic capacities are indicated by his, as far as I can see, uh, unique attainment, uh, the possession of three earned doctorates in medicine, law, and theology. <laughs> it was a, those were long processes to get doctorates uh, back, back then. Well, significant also for the success of the Reform Party was the allegiance of uh, Jakob Sturm, a prominent layman who belonged to a family that for over two centuries had given Strasbourg her ablest magistrates. And in 1522, Sturm was made mayor of the city and held that post for many years. So these were the leaders who labored in Strasbourg when Busser arrived. No wonder he declared the city ready for an overflowing harvest. Well, he put his hand to the plow. At first, his labors were quite circumscribed as the city council would not permit him to lecture publicly because he was an excommunicated priest. So he began to give lectures in the cell household on the pastoral epistles. A few months later, due to growing popularity, he was given the small chapel in the cathedral to preaching. Uh, well, the bishop turned down the people's pleas for him to be given the main cathedral pulpit, so cell's wooden portal pulpit was brought out uh, for the occasion. Uh, alarmed at the growing influence, uh, the Romanists determined to undercut it by calling in all the cathedral monks, whenever he started to preach, to hold their choir practice coinciding with Booster's preaching. So raising their voices so as to drown out uh, Booster, uh, the choir, as you can imagine, quickly irritated his eager hearers. One of the auditors advised the singers to temper their tones in some pretty colorful metaphors, which I will not repeat. And when they flatly refused, it came to a fisticuff. They're in the cathedral. Uh, well, the, cow the, the cowled choir proved outnumbered uh, and outarmed. You see, in those days, you didn't have any pews, so you bring your stool. So stools can be whipped out as really effective equalizers. <laughs> the, uh, the monks were really taking a hitting on this one. Uh, well, just as a full-scale riot was about to uh, break out, with many a, a tonsured head bruised, uh, the chief magistrate entered and ordered both parties to appear before them the next day. Well, this threatened riot brought matters to a crisis, and uh, the hearing went in favor of the reformers, resulting in an official edict for the gospel to be preached in Strasbourg. Well, along with Busser's gain in popularity came a gain in standing. He was enrolled in the Gardener's Guild. The Gardener's Guild. Or the Gardener's Guild. Well, well um, I, it was the guild into which distinguished, uh, the, the way the chronicler puts it, into which distinguished strangers lacking any particular skills <laughs> were often admitted. <laughs> so uh, it was admitted there. That's probably I would be a sure. The Gardener's Guild. <laughs> Had there been a writer's guild of his day, Busser would certainly have qualified for alongside their preaching, the reform team were working on bringing out rapidly solid exegetical commentaries on biblical books. And uh, Busser wielded a fertile and fluent pen. He brought out a commentary on Matthew, pivotal for the conversion of the Italian reformer, Peter Martyr Vermilli. Uh, well, I don't know if we're gonna be able, I hope maybe, I don't know, maybe we'll be able to give lecture on him. And then on the Psalms, uh, which uh, ran into five editions, his commentary on the Psalms, and uh, one of those hailed by Calvin as one of the truly magisterial commentaries of the age. Incidentally, a penmanship would have been required for a post of the Writers Guild. Nah, not a chance. <laughs> Booster's handwriting is awful. It's awful, like almost as bad as Jonathan Edwards in his latter years. But uh, never mind, that's just an aside. <laughs> Well, thus, from rather inauspicious beginnings, 
Bucer had emerged as the animating soul of the Reformation in Strasbourg, a position he would occupy for a quarter century. He would also become the leading Protestant diplomat of his <coughs> time. Uh, his known correspondence numbered some 350 different individuals. And it was Bucer who was so keen to bring together Luther and Zwingli at Marburg in 1529. We talked about that, to settle their supper strife, uh, which divided the reformers. And from Marburg on, Bucer was rarely absent from any imperial diet, any gathering, uh, or Protestant theological summit, always present. Uh, he was called teasingly by his good friend Margarita Blava, a fanatic for unity, a fanatic for unity. And at times, his passion to bring striving parties together, some would argue carried him away. Uh, one, on one occasion, Bugenhagen, so he was a Lutheran colleague, sent Bucer uh, his Latin commentary on the Psalms for him to translate into German. And in his prefatory letter, Bugenhagen had given Bucer politely a free hand. Expound it, my dear Bucer, as freely as you like. Add bits to it, if you will. Strike things out, alter the order, so that it becomes yours as much as mine. Well, it's the kind of thing that scholars say from time to time, not dreaming that anyone will ever take them seriously. Uh, but when the work appeared, including the imprimatur prefaces by Luther and Melanchthon, uh, it was found that in Psalm 110, Bucer had introduced three entire pages of his own, were completely contradicting the Wittenberg party line on the real presence. Uh, so he, uh, he'd altered, uh, as was typical of him, altered their, their kind of Lutheran doctrinal asperities to make the commentary more broadly digestible to the Christian community, the Reformed community. Uh, and this was the sort of thing that he would be inclined to do the hopes of bringing more people together. It just irritated the Lutherans. Well, also flowing from his zeal for mediation was his deliberate strategy of crafting ecumenical creeds that were maximally ambiguous and elastic so that a Swiss and a Lutheran might affirm the same unifying confession while in fact meaning quite different things by the language a bona fide ecumeniac, he has been called. Uh, but uh, most that thought this did not feel the open wound of Protestantism uh, as acutely as he, the division that we had. Well, abroad the diplomat, at home the pastor. Uh, it is noteworthy that while Luther maintained two marks of the true church, true pre the preaching of the gospel, and the right sacraments. Calvin adds a third discipline. Bucer added a fourth, charity, a practical love. This will be the distinguishing mark of the church. His first Strasbourg publication was titled That Every Man Should Love, or should, sorry, That Every Man Should Live Not for Himself, but for His Neighbor. It was no accident that it was to Strasbourg that many hungry and penniless uh, turned to hope and help and haven to Strasbourg. The city was flooded with refugees from the Peasants' War, but relief for the wounded and weary had been organized by the church on a grand scale. Strasbourg also became known as the international haven of dissenters with a singular reputation during Bucer's years for, tolerate, for toleration and leniency. It became a veritable magnet for unwanted nonconformists. As one Italian wrote, himself a guest in Bucer's household, Bucer's home is like a hostel uh, receiving refugees for the cause of Christ from anywhere. In 1549, that one who had received so many refugees himself became a refugee. Through the force of Catholic arms, a religious compromise was to be imposed upon Strasbourg. 
the one who was so commonly accused of being too supple in negotiation, too indefinite in doctrine, packed his bags and left his beloved home rather than abide an alloyed worship that was imposed in the interim by the victory in the field of Catholic arms. A letter from Cranmer, Archbishop Cranmer, across the channel proved timely, inviting the old reformer to come over to England where the seeds of true doctrine have re recently been sowed, Cranmer wrote. Well, Bucer was to be made the Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge. In his inaugural speech, he described himself as, quote, old, sick, useless, and foreign. Well, old, certainly that. He was nearly 60 years of age when 40 was considered old. Sick, manifestly. The Spanish ambassador uh, reported very hopefully and sanguinely to the emperor that the old man was so ill, he quote, surely will not last very long. As uh, did Erasmus when he was in Cambridge. Booster found the damp, cold, just chill you to the bone, British weather a real trial. It is indeed that. I've never been colder than I was in England. And I've been in lots of colder places. I'm just constantly wet. Um, well, to toast out the chill, King Edward VI sent him 20 pounds with which to buy a good continental ceramic stove. In, uh, in continental Europe, you'd have these, these enclosed stoves that were much more effective than just an open fire that were used in England. So they just wanted to keep this guy thought out, to keep him for their theologian. Uh, well, when this proved insufficient, he sent him a second one, and uh, that seemed to do the trick. Uh, digestion for him also proved overtaxing uh, by this everlasting diet. He complains of meat, 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 uh, never relieved by any kraut or vegetables. And uh, the fine wine, which he had enjoyed so much of in Strasbourg, which was very inexpensive, he couldn't afford in England, so had to go without that. So yes, he was ill. But by no means was he useless. He began a lecture series on Ephesians, and as the master of Corpus Christi observed, he powdered his lessons with weighty exhortations to a godly life. While uh, many of his Cambridge auditors regarded him as God's prophet and true preacher, other sources were also proposed for his inspiration. The Duchess of Suffolk, in high regard for the instruction that Booster provided her two sons, presented the Strasburger with a cow and a calf. Uh, and these pets he seemed to greatly enjoy, visiting them regularly on his way to lecture. And this pattern gave rise to the gossip among his enemies that they were really four-footed devils who whispered to him the content of his remarks that he would be about to deliver. Well, three assertions in particular form Booster's sermons and lectures proved obnoxious to many a fellow Cambridge, uh, many a Cambridge fellow. First, the sufficiency of scripture. Second, justification by faith. And third, the possibility that the church could err. Well, Booster was challenged to defend these propositions in a public dispute. The resultant disputation was held in June 1550, and the pivotal subjects so central to the Reformation, Booster defended so thoroughly that the debate stretched into August, so from June into August. And when finally complete, he presented his opponents with a written account of the proceedings and asked if they could add any further objections that he might respond to them in writing. He wanted to be thorough. Well, in 1551, February 1551, his health rapidly worsened. While certain of his friends attended him, they speculated that his failing health was to be attributed to some adverse conjunction of the planets. Booser, hearing them, sat up in his bed and angrily rebuked them. Then pointing upward, he affirmed, it is he, it is he who ruleth and ordereth all things in heaven and earth. It was to be his last didactic moment of a long life given to teaching the truth against human superstition. At his funeral, it became apparent 
for all the controversy he endured, how many Cambridge men he had affected. A crowd of over 3,000 followed the coffin to Great St. Mary's, where they laid him to rest. But Booser was not permitted to lie in peace in the reign of Bloody Mary, uncontent to wreck her wrath on the living alone, she carried her vendetta to the dead. Booser's bones were dug up and burned in the marketplace. Yet the drama did not end here. Three years later, Mary's half-sister, Elizabeth, restored upon Booser the honor that had been bestowed originally. There were no bones left to reinter. They had been burned to ashes. But a memorial was placed upon the spot. Well, of course, Booser's true memorial was the succession of gospel truth passed down in Cambridge through many generations by those who heard him preach, that preached themselves to others, and those to others, and those to others. And indeed, the gospel light at Cambridge has not gone out today. And Booser is remembered there, even still, with pride, as one can tab put it, his remarkable piety indeed and profound learning have produced not a transient, but an everlasting benefit to the church. And another, verily, he was an incomparable ornament to the church. And we might add one who felt the wounds of disunity in the church, like few others, and strove with all the strength in him to heal those wounds by reaching out in the name of the gospel of Christ, a gospel that he so ably and faithfully expounded. Even reaching out to those who in an age of disparities and asperities that most had written off for the faithful minister of Christ, said Booser, must not give up lightly on any.